This is the one way ANOVA video on the logic of hypothesis testing and power calculations. This video illustrates the logic of hypothesis testing and power calculations, starting with the t test as an example. We'll begin with the result that was illustrated in the video on standard deviations and standard errors as summarized on this slide. This is a visual representation of the same information. For our purposes, the sampling distribution of the difference between the means of two groups is bell-shaped, has the same degree of spread, has a center that depends on the value of the underlying means. If those means are identical, the distribution is centered around zero. It turns out that the above picture is the one we'll use for the null hypothesis. If those means are different, the distribution is centered around a value that's different from zero. The bottom picture is the one we'll use for the alternative hypothesis. At its core, the hypothesis test is a counterfactual argument. In general, for a t-test, we're hoping that the means of the two groups being compared will differ. But the way that we make the test is to start by assuming that the means are the same. That's the null hypothesis. We then derive the implications of the null hypothesis. In particular, what patterns of data are likely under the null hypothesis, and what patterns of data are unlikely. We then compare the observed data against these expectations. If the data are consistent with what we expect, then we conclude the null hypothesis holds, and the group means are effectively identical. If the data are inconsistent with what we expect, then we conclude the group means are different. The remainder of this video adds details to this basic argument. To produce a t-test, begin by recognizing that the signal is the difference between the observed group mean. When this difference is near zero, we should conclude the null hypothesis is true, that is, that the true group means are essentially identical. Similarly, when this difference is very large, we should conclude that the null hypothesis is false, that is, that the true group means actually differ. But where should we draw the line? In other words, how large must the difference between the observed group means be? in order to declare statistical significance. To make this idea actionable, we derive the sampling distribution of the signal under the assumption that the null hypothesis is true. What we test is whether the observed signal is an extreme point of that distribution. This slide illustrates the idea for a one-sided test. The p-value is the shaded area. The z-statistic of 1.645, or equivalently a signal of 1.645 standard errors away from zero, generates a p-value of 0 0.05. This is the same illustration for a two-sided test and a p-value of 0 0.05. The 1.645 now becomes 1.96. Again, this is all under the assumption that we have large samples and can replace the t-distribution with a standard model. More formally, the menu for calculating the p-value is a, decide on the test statistic, such as the difference between the group means, derive its sampling distribution under the counterfactual assumption that the null hypothesis is true, and see the p-value is the probability that you'll observe the value of the test statistic, which is as extreme or more so. Statistical software such as R and SAS will make this calculation for you. Now considering power calculations. To perform a power calculation, you need to some know something about the statistical test, something about the groups. Regarding the statistical test, you need to know enough to be able to derive the benchmark between the acceptance and rejection regions. This is entirely based on the null hypothesis and requires knowing whether the test is one-sided or two-sided. This will define the shape of the acceptance region. And you also need to know the desired rate of false positive results. This will allow you to specify the exact benchmark. This slide illustrates the acceptance and rejection regions for a one-sided test with alpha equals 0.05. Once you've derived this benchmark, you're done with the null hypothesis. The final step is to derive the distribution of the test statistic under the alternative hypothesis. Uh, pull in the benchmark that you previously derived, say from the last slide, and thus derive the acceptance and rejection region. Statistical power is the area of the curve that falls within the rejection region. Please note that you'll have to specify how much the group means differ. How to make this specification is covered in another video.
To extend this idea from the t-test to the one-way ANOVA, for the t-test, the quantities the investigator must specify are the two-group means and the standard deviation of the data within any of the study groups. For the one-way ANOVA, the investigator must now specify k-group means and also the relative standard deviation. There is an alternative way to, stru to structure the power calculations, illustrated in this slide, which more easily generalizes to more complex designs, for example, with multiple predictor variables. Here what the investigator does is to fill in the degrees of freedom and the proportion of variation explained for each of the rows of the ANOVA table. This creates something called the non-centrality parameter, derived in the next slide, which for our purposes can remain undefined. But anyway, the non-centrality parameter provides the final bit of information needed to calculate the power. This slide illustrates how the non-centrality parameter is, is calculated and also how it's used in the power calculation. There's no real need to focus on the details. Following the structure of the calculation is sufficient. This slide illustrates how the calculations would be modified for a comparison between just a pair of group means. What makes this approach easy to generalize is even if we add more predictors, even if the predictors have different scale of measurement, the ANOVA table is going to have essentially the same structure, unless your power calculations will as well.